It's a beautiful summer day. Who thinks it's a beautiful summer day? Beautiful, lovely. And, but thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to be in church on this beautiful day. Um, it's always good to be in the house of God called the Vic Juba Theater or Mosaic Church that meets here. So thank you for being here. Psalm 105, verse 19. Psalm 105, verse 19 it says, until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Can we read that verse all together right now? Psalm 105, 19. Together, until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. That's a key verse for our series, From Dream to Destiny. And we're learning how Joseph moved from his dream to his destiny through a series of 10 character tests. 10 tests. And so far, we have talked about the pride test, the pit test, the palace test, purity test, and last week Pastor Todd talked about the prison test. And today we'll talk about the prophetic test. Say prophetic now, when we, when we hear the word prophetic, it, it seems a little scary. It sounds a little scary, right? Because prophecy, future, you, you think, oh my goodness, this is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. A lot of people are scared of the word prophetic or prophecy. But the Bible, um, basically, the Bible defines prophecy not, ju- not, uh, not as, as foretelling the future, <laughs> foretell, but it's telling forth the Word of God. To tell forth. Say, tell forth. Pro- prophecy, or prophetic, just means declaration. Say, declaration. And so God has declarations over us, but He also has in His Word, the Bible, the declaration of His love for all people. And we must find ourselves in that big picture of His story called redemption or salvation. But Jesus did not just save you for no reason or so that you could just feel better. God saved you for something. Say, God saved me for something. And that's his purpose. He has a purpose for your life. And so here's the thing. The prophetic test is about submitting ourselves to the word of the Lord for us. Say submit. So prophetic test is about submitting ourselves to the word of the Lord for us. In fulfilling our destiny, listen, we must first of all know the word of the Lord for our lives. We should know the word of the Lord for our lives, but also we must be willing to submit to that word for our lives. It's authority. So the prophetic test is basically submission to the authority of the word. Say authority. A lot of us struggle with authority, right? Who, who here is a natural rebel? This is, set, this is what's set. You just go against it. I, I don't know. You're, you're just like that. Your teacher says, hey, I want you to walk this line. And what do you do? You walk the line, but backwards. Right? You just, you just want to do something uh, unique for yourself. Well, we're, just, we're just like that. <laughs> but, but if we read this verse that we just read earlier, Psalm 106, or 105, verse 19, in a different version, this is what... Psalm 105 verse 19 says, this is the New American Standard Bible, which is a translation or a version closer to the original language of the Bible, which is Hebrew and Greek. And this is what it says, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. It's a little different from the other version that we just read earlier. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. But this is closer to the original, the Hebrew language of scriptures. We see here two occurrences of the word, word. Until the, what? The time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Word, say word. (laughs) See, these two occurrences, here's the problem with, with our language, you know, English or even, you know, even in Chinese or Filipino or, or whatever your language might be. Modern languages, they're, they're a lot simpler. 
They're not as complex as, say, Jacobian English or Elizabeth, Elizabethan or Bethan English from the 1600s, right? The old Hebrew and Greek languages, not the modern ones, or I guess even the modern ones, they have different words for every word. And so we read the Bible and read two occurrences of the word word, but we are unaware of the fact that these two occurrences have two different words, are actually two different words. So the first occurrence in the first, first phrase there, that his word came to pass is the word, the Hebrew word, the bar. Say the bar. That's where you go when you want to get waste. No, I'm kidding. Um, the bar basically means a matter that is spoken of. It's something that is spoken of, the bar. Say the bar. So don't tell somebody beside you, hey, we'll go to the bar. All right? You just don't do that. We'll say, hey, let's hear the bar of the Lord. All right? The bar. The second occurrence is the word imrah. Say that word with me. Imrah. <laughs> Which means commandment or authority. So if you read this uh, again, knowing these two, two words, two meanings, until the time that his dabar, or what is that which is spoken of, came to pass, the commandment or the authority of the Lord tested him. Makes a difference, right? Makes a huge difference. And like I said, a lot of us, when we read this scripture, we just think, oh, word, word, same, no. And what we're trying to prove here is that Joseph received a prophetic word. Something which is spoken of about him, his future, his destiny. But until he gets to that, or to live out that destiny, he needed to get tested by the word of the Lord. What is the word of the Lord? The authority of God, the Bible, the scriptures that we have. That is what it is for us right now. So Imra, say Imra. We see three, I'll just use three verses here to show you and to prove to you that the word of the Lord means the authority of God or the written word of God. Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. The word words there is imra. And the next verse that we have is Psalm 18, verse 30. As for God, his way is blameless. The imrah of the Lord is tried. It's tested. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Imrah. Say imrah. And the last verse I want to share with you is Psalm 119 verse 11. Your imrah, your authority, your word have I hidden or treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. I am going to treasure your imrah in my heart because if I have it, I know what to do. I know that I shouldn't be doing things that will go against your imrah. Do you, do you follow? Or is it a little too deep or a little too lecture type? Hang in there. You will understand what this means for Joseph. Joseph was 17 when he received his dabar in the form of a dream. And that dream is that one day his whole family will what? Bow down before him. The debar of his life, or the debar of the Lord in his life, is that one day he will be a ruler. He will rule over people. But until that time comes, he needed to be tested by the Imra of the Lord. So that dream did not happen until he was in his 30s. From 17 to 30, how many years in between? It's quite a lot of years. Now, the reality is when we read the story of Joseph, we read through it like when we watch a movie. You don't really see the, diff the, 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 the span of time in between the 13 or the 17 and the 30. There's, there's, a, there's some stories, but yeah, he was put in prison, but he was in prison for a long time. Yeah, yeah, he was a slave, but he was a slave for a long time. That's what we miss 
when we read the Bible, but I want you to imagine 13 years, or let's just say 12 years. If we look back in terms of years, 12 years ago is what year? So those of you who are good at math, 2018 minus 12. Yeah, some time ago. <laughs> Twelve years ago, what were you doing? Twelve years ago, if you're 14, you were two years old. You have just been potty trained. <laughs> Amen. I hope you were. Twelve years ago, if you're in high school now, or, or senior high, you would have been what? Four or five years old? You don't even know what the meaning of the word crush is and now you're overwhelmed by the crush of your life. Amen. Right? Twelve years is a long time. In twelve years, there's a lot of ha things that could happen. In twelve years. I have been living in Canada for, for eight years now. And eight years has been a long time. It's a long time. Seems like an eternity sometimes. Imagine being in prison. Imagine being a slave. Those of you who work for a company that you don't like, or for a boss you don't like, or, or maybe you're, you're struggling in that job, you're just trying to keep it so that you can pay the, the bills. Imagine your life just dragging yourself to work every day. Like, oh God. The life of Joseph is like that. At least you can faintly, faintly imagine yourself being in it or in his life. But he had to go through the Imrah, the test of the Lord. Each test led him to the fulfillment of his dreams. It was God who gave him the dreams, and those dreams were not his destiny. They were reflections of his true Purpose. That's the, uh, another word for the word destiny. Uh, your purpose. Say purpose. His dreams reflected his true purpose. Whatever your dream is for your life or for your future, it's not your destiny. It's going to be either a vehicle or a tool to fulfill your destiny. Do you follow? The years in between, though, <laughs> was huge for Joseph. Joseph didn't realize that his destiny is not just to be a great and rich, powerful man right away. But eventually he realized it in Genesis chapter 50, and we read this verse. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he said, He told his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position. What was that? The second highest position in the land of Egypt. And in between slavery and prison. But God brought me to this position so that I could save the lives of many people. That's when he realized his purpose. There was an intention hidden behind all my experience. There is an intention behind every experience you go through. And it's not just your intention, it's divine intention. The very reason you are here is because God intended for you to be here. So, question. What is your purpose? What is your destiny? Like Joseph, will you be able to say, I am here where I am right now because God let me here so that I could... How would you finish that, that uh, sentence? I am here in my position so that I can, what is it? So that what? So that you can what? What is your purpose? What is your destiny? And we said this before, your destiny is not really a place to arrive at, it's a life to live. It's a life to live. Yes, there's an ultimate destiny called heaven, but there is a life that you need to live out. You don't just arrive at it. So what is your purpose? What is your destiny? Have you ever had a Chick-fil-A sandwich? A Chick-fil-A sandwich. Have you had that before? Look at that. Look at that. 
Chick-fil-A sandwich. Who has had Chick-fil-A sandwich before? Come on. All right, some of you. That's awesome. Can I hear a loud amen from the people who had Chick-fil-A sandwiches? Hey, all right, there's a huge group of teenagers here who's had Chick-fil-A sandwich. Hey, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A was established or founded by a man named Truett Cathy. Say Truett. That's a good name, Truett. He started Chick-fil-A and it has become the favorite fast food of Mary, Mary, many, many Americans. And he made it his company's goal when he started that uh, restaurant to follow the word of God in every way in his life and as a company. First on their list of things that govern their lives as a company is seek first the kingdom of God. Truth, Kathy, Kathy said, my company, we will seek first the kingdom of God. And so, if you go to the States, <laughs> and after church you crave for a Chick-fil-A sandwich, you won't be able to get one because Chick-fil-A stores are closed on Sundays. Because their philosophy is, we want to give our people the opportunity to worship Jesus because worshiping Jesus is more important than making money. That's what they believe. And despite the fact that they're closed on Sundays, which is a huge market, by the way, because there's a lot of people who go to church and they look for food after church. Kind of like how you're feeling right now. You're thinking of where to go. <laughs> despite the fact that they're closed on Sundays, they still made more than $8 billion in sales in 2017. Eight billion. And each store earns 4.4 million dollars a year. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But they're closed on Sundays. <laughs> but God is still blessing them. Here, here's, here's a suggestion. If you ever start a company or a restaurant or whatever, try to close down on Sundays and honor God with your time and worship. And say, God, this is your day. This is your time. I'm going to honor you. I'm telling you he's going to bless you. Just like he blessed through it. He is. And not only that. They don't just close down on Sundays. They also donate surplus food to local shelters and soup kitchens. Who among you here work for a supermarket here in town? I was told that sometimes, most every, every time there's a surplus food, they just dump it all in the garbage. Chick-fil-A? No, no, no. We're going to give these away to people who need it. That's a better philosophy than dumping away food, right? And if you're a homeless person and you walk into a Chick-fil-A store, they will not turn you away. They will feed you. That's their philosophy. Feed the hungry, just like Jesus commanded. I love that. And they also believed that their team members should be able to reach their dreams and their potentials. And so, they have donated, listen to this, $42 million in college scholarships. If you're a teenager and you work for Chick-fil-A, they will promise you, hey, I, we will give you bursary. We will give you scholarship. What college do you get into? We'll make sure that you finish it. Finish your degree. So that one day you can fulfill your dreams. Isn't that good? Helping each other and other people to reach their potential in God. And so Truett Cathy, this man, passed away in 2014. His children now run the company and they're still strong believers. In fact, they're Bible study leaders and, and elders in their churches. Truth Cathy, when he was still alive, he was interviewed and he, he was asked, what is the mission of Chick-fil-A? He said this, to glorify God by being faithful stewards of all that God has entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. Chick to glorify God. To glorify God. That's the purpose of his company. <laughs> what is your purpose? What is the purpose of your company? Or your business? What is it? And Truth Cathy said this. You know, for, for, for him, it was never just about the chicken sandwich. It was about bringing people to Jesus through doing what he is good at. 
chicken sandwiches. So the dream wasn't his destiny. The dream was a tool to finance his destiny. I love that. He said this, the chicken was simply a tool to accomplish my real purpose, which is what? To honor God and to help people know Jesus. And just like Joseph and true with Kathy, your destiny is not just to be great, but it is to honor God in great ways and save many lives. <laughs> just like Joseph. I want you to repeat after me. My purpose is to honor God and save many lives. Whatever you become or whatever you are now, that is your purpose. For Joseph, it was literally to save people from famine. For Truett, and for all of us here, it is to save lives by bringing people to Jesus using what we have been given and what we are good at. Whatever field of greatness God is preparing you for, and I know God is preparing you for something great. Do you believe that? His goal is to use you and your experience, what you're good at, to save many lives by bringing people to Jesus. Here are some biblical principles that we will learn from the life of Joseph in terms of the prophetic test, submitting himself to the Word of God. Can you imagine what Joseph must have felt? He had a dream one day to become a powerful man, and a few weeks later he was in a pit. And a few days later he was a slave. And for years he was a slave. And then he gets accused of doing something he did not do, and he went to prison for, for doing something that is right. For not doing what he was being accused of what he did. And when we read the story of Joseph, it's easy to overlook the years in between the events. But the first 30 years of Joseph's life was all about learning to humbly submit. God's word, Dabar, the prophetic declaration in his life, and the word, Imra of the Lord, for him. He submitted to those two. He knew that one day his dream will come true. And so he submitted himself to the word of the Lord. The testing. Because testing, what? The testing of your faith gives you what? Perseverance. And perseverance, what does it give you? Hope. And hope does not disappoint. It appoints. Hope appoints. I love what Pastor Ta said last week. Hope appoints. And so that's what he had. Hope. And so he submitted himself to the Dabar and the Imra of God. And so the first principle in the prophetic test is this. Until I learn to submit, I will never lead. Until I learn to submit, I will never lead. Joseph did not fight his destiny. He submitted to it. It's interesting that even our destiny is a form of authority that we need to submit to. Did you notice that? Here's your destiny. It's yours. If you submit to it. Until I learn to submit, I will never lead. Many people are unable to live out their destiny because they don't know how to submit. So church, let's learn how to humbly submit to God's authority and to those whom God placed over us and above us. Even though it was hard, Joseph submitted to Potiphar. He was a rich man's son, for goodness sakes. And he finds himself as a what? A slave to Potiphar, a foreigner, a pagan man. Did he fight back? No. He submitted. And because he submitted, he was blessed. The presence of the Lord was with him. Genesis 39 verse 6 says, So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. And even though Joseph was unjustly prisoned, he submitted to the prison warden. He did not try to escape. <laughs> 
but he was put in charge eventually to, of the other pr prisoners. 39.22, Genesis 39.22 says this. The warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. Question, if he rebelled or fought back, would he become a leader? He would not have become a leader. Until you learn to submit, you will never lead. One of my favorite preachers, Levi Lusco, he said, you know what, until you are able to submit to somebody else's vision, you will never have a vision for your own ministry. And I love that. I love that. See, while many people struggle with authority, God is telling us today, you are different. I want you to submit because until you learn to submit, you will never be in authority. I want you to be in authority. This is what God is saying to you. I want you to be the head and not the tail. I want you to be lending, not borrowing. Until I learn to submit, I will never lead. And while Joseph was in prison, he met two men. And Pastor Ta alluded to this last week, a cupbearer to the king and a baker in the palace. Both men ended in prison. And the Bible tells us that both had dreams that upset them. The cupbearer dreamt that he picked grapes from three grape branches. He squeezed the juice into a cup and served it to the king. The baker dreamt that he was carrying three baskets of bread over his head, but the birds started to eat them. Neither of them did, uh, knew what the meaning of their dreams were. And so that upset them. What did Joseph notice? That they were upset. That's what the Bible says. Pastor Tal read that for us. Joseph, in Genesis 40 verse 6, said this. <laughs> when Joseph saw the next morning, he noticed that they were both upset. What is this? I want you to know this is now. They were all in prison. The baker, the cupbearer, and Joseph. Yeah, he was the leader. He was, he was in charge of the prisoners. But, but here's the thing. They were all prisoners, and they should all be upset. But Joseph, even in that situation, still found time and a way to consider other people's needs above his. He could have gone to the prisoners and said, Oh, you, you, your life sucks? Mine too. Oh, now let's party together. Let's, let's party. What do we drink to? Oh, we don't have a drink. I'm sorry. They could have had a pity party. But Joseph said, Hey, how can I help? Hey, hey how, what can I do? What can I do? And so here's the, the second principle in the prophetic test. Until I learn to give, I will always feel needy. Did you notice how this situation is a far cry from what Joseph was like when he was 17? When he was 17, it was all about me! My dream! My destiny! My dad loves me! I have a beautiful, beautiful robe that I can, I don't know, display around people. I'm awesome! Y'all you are, are going to bow down before me. This is a far cry from that 17-year-old. Hey, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? And so he interpreted those two people's dreams. One of them, the baker, eventually, eventually remembered him. And that is who actually God used to bring him out of prison so that he can step into his destiny. It was in that moment of uh, almost an insignificant moment if you think about it. Oh yeah, you're a prisoner? How can I help? Who knew that the person that he was going to help would be the one to help him to step into his destiny? So there's power in the little things that God brings to your life. Don't ever overlook some of the little things that happen in your life. Can I hear an amen? amen. Don't. Because God could use whatever you do in that situation to 
propel you to something great. So until I learn to give, I will always feel needy. He gave of his time. He gave of his energy to those people in need. So that's the second principle. The third principle in the prophetic test is this. Until I learn to walk in God's ways, I will never know God's will for myself. Psalm 119 verses 1 to 3 says this, Joyful are the people of integrity who follow the, 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 the imrah of the Lord, the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey His word, imrah, and search for Him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil. They only walk in His way. Say His way. Say God's way. So stop trying to get, to get God to reveal His concealed will. God wants us to be obedient to His revealed will. What is that? The Imrah, the Word of the Lord. The Bible. The Bible is God's revealed Word for all of us. And so here's the thing. Stop asking God, God, reveal to me the hidden will that you have for me. You just give me a glimpse of the future. God's not going to do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> He'll probably give you dreams that reflect your future, but not entirely the whole picture. Because God wants you to submit to His ways, which is the Word of God. The Imra of God. Say Imra. See, when you are in God's ways, you are in God's will. If you're following the Word of God, you are... In the will of God. More important than tracing the hand of God, one preacher said. More important than tracing God's hand, it's discovering where He wants us to go. It's learning God's heart and discovering who He wants us to be. Stop asking God, God, where do, I, where do you want me to go? Where are you at right now? That's where God wants for you to be. And so where you're at, Discover what God wants for you to be where you're at. That is God's will for you. Because you'll never know His ways until you, or your will, His will, until you walk in His ways. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says this, Don't copy the behavior of, and customs of this world, but let God transform you. Say transform. Into what? Into a new person by changing the way you think. What happens when God transforms you by changing the way you think? Then you will learn to know God's will for you. Isn't that clear? Is that clear? So here's the thing. Realize that God's will is present more than future. When I walk in His ways, I will always be in His will. Can I hear an amen? amen? Charles Stanley, one of the, the old pastors that I still listen to, he said this, Obey God and leave the consequences to Him. What does that mean? Just follow God's word, and whatever the consequences may, may be, just let Him handle it. So here's the thing, we're afraid to obey because we think of the consequences in advance. If I do this, then I have to do this, and this will happen. You're, you, you get scared, right? But Charles Stanley said, hey, if you obey God and just leave the consequences to Him, He'll make sure that everything falls into place because you, or, you're already following in His way. Leave the consequences to God. So until I learn to walk His ways, I will never know His will for me. The next principle is this. Until I learn to abide, I will never see fruit. And I preached a sermon series on this, on abiding in Christ. Until I learn to abide, I will never see fruit. Abide means to stay, to live, to remain. Remain, say remain. Jesus said in John chapter 15 verses 4 and five, 4 to 5 says, Remain in me or abide in me or live in me and I will remain, abide or live in you. Do you see the condition there? 
Abide in me and I will remain in you. For a branch, you're a branch, cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. Who's the vine? Jesus is. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Because that's where you draw your power from, your strength from. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Until I learn to abide, I will never see fruit in my life. If you want to be fruitful, even now, and live out your destiny now, then you should learn to abide. To abide, to remain in Christ. Here's the thing, a lot of people don't abide because when, when the first storm comes, they, they get shaken by it and they think, oh, it's probably because I chose Jesus. Maybe I should move back or step away from Jesus. He's bringing bad luck to my life. <laughs> Somebody said to me this, you know, ever since I received Jesus, there have been more challenges in my life. You know why? Because you're making progress. And I've said this before, if you're flip playing football, you don't get tackled if you're seated on, be on the bench, right? You don't get tackled by the enemy if you're just sitting around. You get tackled because you're making progress in your life. That's why there's a lot of storms, a lot of, a lot of trials, a lot of difficulties. And here's the thing, the victory is already yours. But you need to abide, stay put, be anchored, be rooted. What does that mean, Pastor John? Number one, be rooted in Jesus. Be rooted in Jesus. That's where you draw your strength from. It's He who gives you the strength to bear fruit. What does abide mean, Pastor John? Remain in the community that God has planted you in. A lot of people in this very consumer-driven and consumer-minded world, we think, oh, I can always transplant myself from one place to another. But will you see fruit if you keep transplanting yourself? Maybe a little bit, but, but God has more for you. If you would only abide in Him. So stop moving yourself. Stop transplanting yourself. You will just suffer from transplant shock. What is transplant shock? I, I said this in, in my past sermon series. A transplant shock is this. You take a plant, take it out of its pot, plant it in another, make it stay there for two weeks, and it will grow roots. But if you're not satisfied with that, take that plant again, plant it in another pot. Eventually, that plant will never, ever bear fruit. Why? Because you keep transplanting it, and it's getting shocked all the time. That's what happens to us when we keep transplanting ourselves. But if you plant your roots deep, that's when you experience the power of God. Move and, and just ooze and flow in your life, and that's when fruit begins. That's when you begin to live out your destiny in Christ. But what's inter interesting about the verses that we read earlier, chapter 4, the verse before that, go back to John chapter 15. 4 and 5, now let's read the, for the two verses before that. Now, John chapter 15, verse 2. There it is. Remain in me. Now, verse 2 says this, And he, God, prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the Imrah, the Logos, the word that I have given you. Right now, even now, you are being purified and pruned by the Word of God. He is challenging you even now. Do I believe this preacher? Do I believe what he's saying? This is what God is saying to you. Believe my Word. If you remain in Jesus, you will experience some pruning. See, if you ask a plant if he likes to be pruned, I'd say you can't. They don't talk back. All right? <laughs> but if they can talk back to you, they will say this. Pruning actually helps me. It helps me become more fruitful. And I go
go back to that situation and that comment that I made the past few weeks. Getting tested is a good thing. Getting pruned is a good thing. Just like Joseph who experienced a lot of pruning, it's a good thing for him. It made him become the man God wanted for him to be. And so pruning for you is a good thing. So once you hear the shears of God coming, say, God, I'm ready. And that's what Pastor Todd talked about last week. Having joy in circumstances that are difficult. Knowing that this circumstance will bring something good in my life. It'll bring something good. I want to be a branch that's fruitful. And if it takes pruning for me to be more fruitful, then God, um, I welcome that. Because that which hasn't been tested cannot be trusted. That which hasn't been pruned God will prune you even more and make you more fruitful. And I love that. So until I learn to abide, I will never see fruit. And the Word of God is pruning us. When you read the Word of God and you see a challenging verse and it tells you, I want you to do this, child. My child, I want you to do this. I want you to love your enemy. I want you to give. I want you to do this. I want you to serve. That's, that's one way of pruning. That's one way of testing you. Will you say yes to God when you read those things? Or will you just say, my friends are perfectly happy without following Jesus. They're richer than me. I could probably have that too. Maybe I'll choose that. Don't. You don't know what they might be going through. Maybe they look happy, but they are not. But where God has put you and placed you, I want you to just abide. Remain. Abiding is what brings fruitfulness. So stay with Jesus. Stay with your church, your community. You all church hoppers, you remain in the faith. Be strong in your grip. Be anchored, secure. I recently got a tattoo that says Yeshua, Jesus. I'm getting another one here that is an anchor. To remind me all the time that I want to keep stay rooted in Christ. And even if the storms of life come, I know that I am anchored in Jesus. Be anchored secure. See, that's when your life begins to grow roots. That, that's when you make fruit when you're anchored secure on the deathbed of Joseph's father the man named Jacob he was about to die Jacob called all his sons all 12 sons to gather around him so that he could bless them Finally, he could just say and proclaim the imra, the, the debar of God over his, his children. And this is what he said. Look, look at Jacob's final words to Joseph. Genesis 49, 22. Jacob said, Joseph, <laughs> you're a fruitful vine. A fruitful vine near a spring. You will never ever wilt. <laughs> Whose branches climb over a wall. What's that wall? Every challenge that Joseph ever faced. He climbed it all. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. But his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob. Because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. <laughs> if you're anchored secure, abiding in God, you can climb every difficult situation you might find yourself in. And even God would even split a seat so that you could go through it. <laughs> and no matter how much I know arrows get hurled at you or shot at you. What does the Bible say? <laughs> you will remain steady. You will 
remain steady. Who wants to remain steady here? All of us do. So that is the final word of Jacob's of Jacob to, to Joseph. I wonder what God's word will be for you or about you. My child, you, you are a strong branch, a fruitful branch in my kingdom. Don't you want to hear that? Oh, my, my son, you, good and faithful servant, my daughter, you, you are fruitful beyond measure. Because of me, I am going to keep blessing you and your future generations will see that I am faithful. How do people, how, do the, how does the future generation know that God is true? Through your faithfulness. Your future generation will see if God worked in my mother's life or my grandmother's life or my grandfather's life, he could work in my life too. Are you a fruitful vine like Joseph? Will you submit to the prophetic test of God? Will you say yes? Will you not run away when a test comes into your life? Will you stay rooted? Will you stay anchored? I hope you say yes, Jesus. Yes. I want you to make a commitment before God right now. God, it's in my submission that I am able to reach my potential for you. I want us to stand to our feet. And the, lead, the team here will lead us to a song called Touch the Sky. Some of y'all like that song. But there's one part of that song that says, What treasure waits be within your scars, this gift of freedom gold can't buy. What is that? This is Jesus sacrificing himself to you. And, he, and it says, I bought the world. Yeah, I had everything, and, but, but I sold my heart. But you traded heaven to have me again. And, and this is what God is telling us today. I want you to start anchoring yourself in me and to be, to be submitted to my word, to be completely submitted to my authority. Because if I am the authority, I'm also the author. And if I'm the author, I know how your story goes. Amen? So we submit to the author. You don't try to rewrite your story. Let the author write your story. And it's going to be good. Thank you for joining us at Mosaic Church. If you have been blessed by today's message, or if you have made the decision to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please let us know about it. Email us at mosaicloyd at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. If you wish to know more about our church, you may visit us online at www.mosaicloyd.com. God bless you. See you again next week.